you very much for, for having me and I'm quite impressed that the room is still full at this time. <laughs> I was really hopeful. Um, okay, some facts on South Africa. Um, South Africa is amongst the top 20 global emitters in the world. Um, we have a population of about 49 million people and you're probably wondering why we're amongst the top 20 global emitters since we're such a small country. Uh, but this is primarily because our, um, our energy needs are satisfied by coal. About 68% of our energy needs are from coal. And the bulk of this coal is for energy production, for electricity production. Um, about 53% um, of total emissions are from electricity generation. And ESCOM, our, our electricity um, utility, is one of the top three emitters globally. A, l a large portion of coal is also for coal to liquid uh, petroleum production. Our company Sasol is listed amongst the top 20 emitters in the world. And this picture tells the whole story more or less in terms of, in terms of how you're doing. And you can see that our CO2 emissions are largely driven by GDP growth. And it's largely because of the structure of the industry. We've got some large capital intensive industries we are a mining based industries and our mines are quite deep so they do use a lot more electricity than, than mines elsewhere in the world. Um, and just to give you a picture of how we compare, the energy intensity has come down over time but it is also um, quite high relative to um, various countries. So I've compared South Africa in this slide to, to other developing countries and just for interest sake have also included Germany and you can see that our emissions and ten our energy intensity across sectors is, is quite high. So what are we doing around um, policy interventions to mitigate? Um, I've kept this slide at a very high level um, we do have a national um, development plan. This is a newly released document that focuses on, on various aspects of, of the country's development, uh, but the environment is quite prominent in, a, in the plan. It gets a chapter all on its own, largely because there is wide recognition and, um, and acceptance that we have to do something, because South Africa does have adverse um, will be adversely affected by, by climate change. There are a series of energy policies and plans that also take climate into account. This would be through our integrated energy plan, um, as well as our integrated resource plan, which is for electricity, which has started to internalize some of the climate impacts by, by adding some, some elements of renewable energy. We have got some strong work around climate response and what we are doing. Um, we have a national strategy for sustainable development. And there's a number of sectoral policies that are aimed at um, developing um, sort of green, green industries. Um, we are doing very specific work. Um, there was a session this morning in which some of my colleagues from the ERC presented on the long-term mitigation scenarios work that has been done. There is work that's being done on mitigation at um, sectoral level. We're also beginning to do some work around long-term adaptation um, scenarios and specific programs around waste management. And there's growing areas such as recycling and, and local production and installation of solar water heating. The areas that I've put in a light grey, such as um, development of a green growth strategy, are light grey because it's work being developed. Um, and then on top there, I have reflected on, on some of the commitments that we had made in Copenhagen. But this is light grey because the commitments um, hinged on us getting some international climate finance, so that hasn't come through, so this is a grey area. But we still... Um, we still have some level of commitment to, um, to, to reducing emissions. Just taking a picture of, of the economy, because one does have to, from, from a policy analysis perspective, look at the economy and, and how the South African economy performs and where do we see climate coming in. The current economic environment in South Africa is, is not supportive of accelerated growth and job creation. 
Um, and this is due to a number of factors. There are some capacity limitations in certain areas to implement policy um, as well as to lift up potential growth, particularly at um, a sub-national government level. And of course this does have implications for how one goes about um, mainstreaming climate issues. We have got electricity shortages and rapidly rising electricity prices. What this means is if you've got no electricity and you have to choose between building another coal fired station and building renewables because you do not have um, carbon pricing, you pick the coal fired station. It appears to be cheap. So that does have some implications. We have infrastructure bottlenecks in terms of ports, rail and, and the road network. Um, and we need to add capacity in all of these areas. And at the moment, we're in quite a constrained fiscal environment, not as constrained as the rest of Europe, but um, for us, we see it as a constrained fiscal environment due to the weak global economy and also weak um, investor confidence domestically. And there's been fairly slow progress on the global climate front. So for us, this sort of lends itself to the bits in, in the, in the grey bar that if you continue along these lines and not much is happening, you will have low growth, you'll have lower job creation, you are unlikely to achieve your emissions reduction. So we see a lot of things as, as having to change for, for South Africa to, um, to internalize what we have to do on, on, on the climate front. This is a picture of, of the electricity situation. I put this slide just to give you a sense because when I start to talk about some of the political economy um, considerations, electricity is going to come up a lot. Um, but our electricity prices have um, had to increase quite sharply over the last five years. Um, and our integrated resource plan sees electricity prices increasing quite sharply. Um, between 2010 and 2030, uh, but it's largely because prices have been or were quite low in, in the mid-90s um, and we took too long to make decisions around building new capacity. So now we've basically run out of power, we need to build new capacity and we haven't priced in the fact that we would have had to replace current assets. So prices have had to adjust quite rapidly but at the same time we have to manage electricity demand. Okay, so to get to the gist of the presentation, South Africa is considering um, a number of carbon pricing mechanisms. Um, for this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the carbon tax because of time, but there is work being done on um, carbon budgeting approaches across various sectors and also some work being done around whether we need to have a, um, an emissions trading scheme and, and how that would work. Um, we have done some modelling of the carbon tax. I'm not going to discuss this much, but you're welcome to go and read James's paper, um, which he presented on this morning, which will give you uh, an indication of the type of work that we had to model. But in 2010, at the end of 2010, we published a discussion paper on a carbon tax and how it might work. We've done some internal modeling with the assistance of, of UNUIDA. Um, and from the, the modeling work that we've done, we have an indication that given the level and mode of recycling, carbon taxes could have a small negative impact on the economy, but revenue recycling is, um, is an area that we will have to seriously consider to, um, to ensure that we manage the, the growth and distributional outcomes in the economy. <coughs> Um, and that we could use the additional uh, revenue to resolve bottlenecks in the economy, which could give us a double dividend. But of course, in a political economy set up, all of this is, is quite debatable. Um, the elements of the carbon tax, we, we have taken the approach that we will phase in the carbon tax gradually over a period. Um, but we need to have some exemptions for trade exposure. Um, and to have some offsets to retain some elements of competitiveness. Um, and that we're looking to have incorporated into the design some exemptions for efficiency gains. Um, 
And in terms of border tax adjustments, we have decided we cannot have border <coughs> tax adjustments at this stage, but if you read James's paper, it will present um, both sides of, of the argument. You might be wondering why carbon pricing is important for, for a country like South Africa, primarily because of the, uh, the threat of, of border tax adjustments that could be imposed on South Africa. We do rely on our minerals quite heavily for, for export revenue, um, and that loss of, um, of competitiveness would be quite a big dent. And then there's, of course, our own developmental needs. Because we will be so adversely affected by climate, uh, we would also lose some of our tourism and agricultural revenue. How much time do I have, Chani? OK, five more minutes. Right, there's a lot to say. OK, Polit <laughs> political economy considerations. So while South Africa has been very good at actually participating on um, on climate fora globally and being part of the UNFCCC discussions around climate and this broad acceptance that we need to, to do a lot about climate change. The climate discussions has gone in parallel with the economic discussions. The two just haven't converged and met where they're supposed to meet. Um, and we're getting to the stage where after the, the 2009 Copenhagen commitments we had to then bring the two together to say, okay, we've made these commitments, so what does it mean? Um, and when the discussion started and all of us realized there would be pain, of course we've had to manage some vested interests. Um, so I've divided the vested interests both in two ways. So there's private sector vested interests. And the private sector vested interests have largely not been a rejection about the fact that we have to do something about climate change but they've been about policy uncertainty and risk. And it's largely because there is currently policy uncertainty and risk in the economy. And they feel we are just adding now a new layer to the policy uncertainty and risk, and that the timing is not right, um, and that there are too many competing policy objectives in the South African economy. This is their area of, of discomfort. And the fact that government is not talking as one. So you will have some government departments that says you need to become more energy efficient, you need to do a lot, um, and that should be the primary focus, but at the same time we want to localise, we want more employment, and they're saying, well, we don't know what exactly you're asking us to do. And a lot of these are international firms that feel that they have to compete with their counterparts elsewhere in the world, and. Um, and they don't understand what we are saying to them as government. So that's, that's come up as an issue. But largely it's a transition issue for them as well. <coughs> they would like to hear from government. So they agree with our numbers in terms of the end state. But they want to know how we are going to help them manage the challenges that they will have to go through um, in making the adjustments around climate change because all of the costs are increasing at... Um, at the same time, and of course we are being threatened with closure of firms and lower FDIs and, and the list continues. Um, the vested interests are also there in, in the public sector, in that um, departments um, at, all, at all spheres of government actually expect to have parallel economic processes and announcements at once. So, they don't want to change existing programs. They're happy to have climate programs in addition to their, um, to their current work, but they don't want to change or review any of their programs quite radically. And that's also understandable because there is social pressure in a number of areas for departments to deliver. And it's really difficult to say, well, let's take a bit more time and think about how we're going to do this when there's been a delay in actually the delivery of services. Um, so dealing with trade-offs has, um, has had to be about um, ensuring that there's better alignment between planning and implementation. Um, it's involved some review of, of institutions and figuring out what it is that we're doing, uh, at least at a national government level, um, starting with at least managing our domestic climate finance programs and exactly what we're doing there, 
and also having some sort of agreed conduit on how we will deal with international climate finance once we receive it in South Africa, which have, we have not done very well in the past. There's also the issue around reporting. Um, the deployment of additional tools also refers to the analysis and the, the type of analysis that we've had to do to, um, to manage some, some of the trade-offs that we'll have to deal with and also messaging of some of these reforms to politicians and, and the public. This is the list of questions that we've been confronted with. Um, you think everyone is happy, you put out a carbon tax paper and you've got a multitude of questions that you, um, that you have to deal with. Electricity comes up quite a lot. Um, largely the issue in the electricity sector is we want to have a carbon tax, but we also have an integrated resource plan that tells the utility what to build. So you have an inbuilt um, you have an inbuilt carbon budget, so what are you saying? Again, the mixed messages that, that industry has, has been referring to. Um, and it's also brought about some questions about, well, okay, if we only have coal, where are we going to get this clean energy from? Um, and how much energy will we have to import from our neighbours? Because a lot of the clean energy will have to come out of South Africa, uh, will be from outside South Africa, yet we have a cap on, on how much energy we can import um, into South Africa. There's been questions about border tax adjustments, what should the role of border tax adjustments be? Uh, will we have first mover advantage if we do this, or are we just penalising our firms for, for no reason? Okay, so in terms of the work that we've had to do, we had to, we've had to look at costs and benefits measured in terms of jobs, equity and economic growth terms. Because temperature rises, water level increases have no meaning to households and politicians. It's sort of seen as um, another layer of bureaucracy that's where we're saying, well, we will take the, the most expensive route as usual. Um, so we've had to be quite innovative. Um, so we have started some partnerships, one of which is um, with WIDA, in developing economic tools that link climate change and economic models to, and energy models to economic models. Um, so that area of work is, is developing very well. Um, also evaluating economic impacts of various energy paths because in the past this has not been done very well, and also integrating our, our, our regional energy options and trying to see what the climate change impacts will be as well within the region, because it's no point considering hydro um, if your source for the hydro scheme is going to dry up in a few years and you've sunk in a significant investment there, as well as um, evaluating the economic impacts of climate change and various mitigation and adaptation options. Um, and then, of course, the management of, of the internal politics has, has been quite challenging, but it's been something that um, we've had to invest in um, quite a lot. So what have we learned um, in, in doing this work around the carbon tax? Um, I think for me personally, um, it's just the realisation that the development path, of course, is never simple. Uh, we've had to accept that there will be lags between the policy decisions, um, program implementation, and then the realisation of the results. Um, there are real trade-offs. Um, it's an issue that came up, I think, in, in the opening plenary, that climate is seen as a soft issue, uh, whereas you've got some real challenges on the ground that you have to deal with. Um, so the trade-offs are important to recognise and also understanding that you'll have to compromise. Um, and the compromise for me is, is much better to ensure that there's gradual mainstreaming of, of climate change rather than fighting too hard to make sure you get things right and then nothing does happen. So the preference that we are going for is, is starting small and seeing where the quick wins are uh, because in some areas, making the adaptation or even mitigating is, is not as costly. Uh, but building capacity is quite important before we, we roll out any, any large schemes in, in, in South Africa. So I think I will end off there. Thank you very much. Thank you.